Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for that, David. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, and I apologize that I've not been here uh, earlier today or I gather at what was a fun dinner last night. So uh, let me apologize again. Uh, I think I'm scheduled about um, 30 minutes, 20 minutes uh, presentation and 10 minutes questions. And in the spirit of uh, the topic, um, I'm actually just going, I have a set of slides. I noticed a couple of people around the audience that uh, I know well and have seen me do some of these things before and they're like, oh God, not those again. Uh, but I'm going to just concentrate probably at least in my formal part on, on this one uh, and then maybe use some of the others to help answer any questions that may come up. Uh, those of you, ha, how many of you have never even heard of the review that I chaired on antimicrobial resistance? Okay, well, that's a relief. <laughs> uh, how many of you have never heard of, uh, of something called the Ten Commandments? A couple of people. So, uh, I've often said that uh, actually leading this review was possibly the most stimulating thing I've ever done in a, a very fortunate professional life. And there are many, many reasons why that was the case. And um, one of them is that intellectually uh, it is so curious and complex. Uh, and in our final report, as I'm sure sounds like all of you know, um, we came up with 27 uh, specific recommendations that essentially uh, covered 10 connected areas. Uh, and if you can see this slide clearly, which actually I'm struggling to do here, which is probably some, uh, my, my, my too much travel and getting old, um, but hopefully you can. Uh, these are the 10 uh, interconnected areas, um, and the notion of 10 commandments refers back to uh, an interesting piece the White Times uh, published and gave the title, uh, 10 Things to Solve Antimicrobial Resistance back in, uh, I think it was in the reasonably early days of, of this uh, early 2016 of our review. So I thought what I'd do uh, in the remainder of the first 20 minutes is, is make reference to uh, where things are on, on, on that two and a half years uh, on, but in particular, uh, more importantly, make reference to where I think uh, things could be done uh, more between the UK and India. And I should say, in, in the former regard, um, David, I think uh, we can say that Chatham House is going to be at the core uh, of hosting an event about actually having some independent analysis about what's happened uh, on policies uh, since the O'Neill Review finished uh, sometime late spring, early summer, uh, May time. So with that in mind, let me, uh, let me proceed. So um, again, as those of you that have, have watched me present before know uh, I do this um, because I think it's important. The whole approach we took was linked to what my supposed uh, training and speciality is, which is an economist that spent a lot of time in the world of finance. Uh, and, and I like to describe all these 10 things as essentially five demand reduction interventions, uh, three uh, supply boosting interventions, uh, with vaccines playing a special role that sort of straddle the two of them, and then uh, international cooperation, which is, you know, rather independent. And so let, let me uh, go through them each very quickly with a a minute or so about each, and I'll make some concluding comments, and then I'll stop for questions. So the first one of the demand uh, ones, and arguably actually also has relevance for supply, is uh, the issue of public awareness. And uh, in the spirit of how I often like to do these things, to provoke you, given that we are very close to an Indian election, is this topic on the agenda uh, with any profile of either major political party in India? I see a couple of people shaking their heads, which adds to my suspicion that that is the case. And from the little that I've looked at the issue as it relates to India, which is not uh, nothing, uh, it should be. Uh, one of the reasons I was asked to do this review is, of course, because I have Mr. Bricks stamped on my forehead. Uh, it'll be there forever. 
uh, but unless India gets to grips with this problem, India is not going to reach at all uh, the potential uh, that myself and some colleagues from Goldman Sachs first laid out in 2001 and 2003. So it should be uh, more prominent uh, in the Indian focus of policy, and more importantly, linked to many other broader social issues in India, uh, there are hundreds of millions of people in India that I'm sure that have absolutely no idea what the hell this thing is. Uh, and I applaud in that regard uh, aspects or, in fact, the whole focus of Modi's uh, Clean India campaign, but this thing needs to be given degrees more seriousness than it seems to me it is. I notice this with interest that regards a very interesting article uh, about the uh, River Ganges in the Financial Times today that some of you may have seen that sort of sums up the whole uh, dilemma. Uh, as it relates to uh, general progress on this, obviously uh, the UK likes to think of itself as being the guys that make more noise about it than anybody. Uh, I have to say, uh, for any people here from DH or in government, I'm rather pleased that Matt Hancock, uh, our reasonably new Secretary of State for Health, uh, and I'll come back to this in a couple of minutes, has uh, taken uh, the boldness of trying to apply some version of our market entry reward model uh, for new drugs, not least because whether that works or not, it adds to the UK getting back into what seems to have been a vacuum uh, for the past two and a half years of UK global leadership on the topic. And uh, yes, there is more public awareness about antimicrobial resistance today than perhaps there was uh, three years ago or five years ago, but nowhere near uh, as much as it should be. The second thing uh, which links closely to what I've just said about uh, what India can do more, more on, and certainly with cooperation with anybody, including the UK, is of course, as I've just, or not indirectly, directly touched on, is sanitation and hygiene. Uh, one of the relatively easy wins uh, is linked to making people aware of some pretty basic things about all of this. I think you had Sally Davis here talking yesterday. I'm not sure if she mentioned her famous hand washing to, uh, the tune of Happy Birthday, but um, I think it's still the case. Uh, there are hundreds of millions of people in India who probably don't have the chance to wash their hands properly every day. Uh, and if they did, that in itself uh, would have a huge impact, as indeed is the case throughout, of course, uh, the emerging world. And before I forget to say it, and I because I quizzed about what the themes have been, obviously that relates very importantly to the to the highly... Uh, important recognition that in many parts of the world, India included, I suspect in some places more than others, uh, access, not excess, uh, is key. In fact, one of the biggest uh, takeaways uh, I found as our review matured is that uh, crucial dilemma, uh, especially in the so-called emerging world. Uh, the third, I'll, I'll talk about the third and fourth together in the Indian context. Uh, both in really important uh, issues for the demand reduction side, surveillance and rapid diagnostics. Um, as we highlighted in our review, and in fact as evidenced by the fact on our sort of loose advisory board, uh, we ended up with a couple of prominent uh, Indian people on our advisory board. Um, the whole uh, role of technology as it relates to both surveillance and diagnostics uh, is obviously crucial. And one of the areas I don't think uh, there's been uh, much cooperation at all, but would be obvious through the various links that Britain and India have, both formally through governments, but also uh, informally through business, is on uh, surveillance. Uh, we were, uh, as we did in all the BRICS countries and to other important countries, we went on week trips uh, around these places, including India, and uh, we were really impressed with some of the people we came about, uh, came across on their surveillance capabilities. Uh, and I seem to recall that SRI, uh, the entity that became on our advisory board, back then, which had been now getting on for five years ago, had surveillance technology and pricing power 
that was allowing them to analyze samples from the top hospitals in London and getting it back to them within 24 hours with pretty powerful uh, stuff. And I'm sure there must be others uh, given India's expertise in uh, technological applications where that must be the case. And I would have thought uh, there must be all sorts of uh, areas for cooperation on that. Diagnostics are uh, a really important cousin, as I'm sure uh, a number of you know here. Uh, when I'm often asked which is the most important of any of these ten, I say uh, none. They are all equally important. Uh, but then if the gun comes to my head and say you're only allowed one, uh, it might indeed be diagnostics. Uh, I'll say now and I'll come back to it. As much as we need new powerful vaccines and drugs, uh, from what little I still understand of the science, that will only solve it for uh, a period until they, these clever things find a way of being resistant. What we need to do is uh, stop treating these things like sweets uh, and to permanently reduce the demand uh, for antibiotics, in particular, remembering access, not excess, uh, the ones that are not needed, of which there seems to be a very large number of. And I... I'm slightly disappointed in this regard about the Matt Hancock unveiling of the updated five and 20 year UK strategy that they weren't bolder about diagnostics and I spent quite a bit of time with Matt's key people in the build up to it. Uh, and we need, as, if we really want to be truly global leaders on this, the UK uh, needs to itself be at the forefront of it and to carry other probably more developed countries but also to help countries like India uh, use affordable state-of-the-art diagnostics so we cut out uh, the ridiculous amount of unnecessary uh, prescription. And as a slight cousin to that, uh, let me also add that I experienced from when we were out there, because the BBC was following us around, so we're playing very clever BBC games of going to buy illegal ones within 30 seconds, uh, the widespread uh, ease in which you can get any antibiotic you want within a minute in any uh, major Indian city. Uh, and we need proper diagnostics in order to uh, get ahead of that uh, situation. Um, and then the last one, of course, is in agriculture, which I know is a particular feature uh, of, uh, of this event and the interplay between animals and humans. Uh, it goes without saying that this isn't just an issue in humans, it's one in animals too. Uh, and I have to say, speaking as candidly as I do, and apologies to any Indian policymakers here, um, it was quite disappointing uh, when we first succeeded in trying to get AMR on the G20 agenda. Let, let's just say certain important countries from the emerging world were trying to resist it, particularly uh, the issue about restricting the use of antimicrobials for growth promotion. Uh, and uh, I think we have made a bit more progress, at least in terms of that phrase, uh, in the subsequent two G20 uh, meetings. Um, but it is obvious, as we see through some very powerful scientific uh, studies that relate to China, where probably the data is more available than it is in India, the overuse of antibiotics, particularly things like colistin, in animals is causing grave consequences uh, around the world. And I have strong suspicion, without any knowledge, that that might indeed be the case uh, in India too. I've just realized I should have said in the sanitation hygiene thing, uh, something which, particularly given the role of uh, so-called generic pharmaceutical producers, uh, the, the whole issue of, uh, of pollution and environmental degradation is obviously uh, something that India needs to be at the forefront of. Uh, and I find a, a, an interesting, stronger appetite amongst the major uh, branded Western pharmaceutical companies to treat that more seriously at the moment than they are doing about the search for new drugs. Although hopefully Matt Hancock's uh, policy initiative will change that here in the UK. So let me quickly uh, turn to the other side of the equation uh, and start with vaccines, because I say it straddles the two. Um, 
scope for cooperation between any countries on this. Uh, it is interesting that in, in, in the intensity of the policy focus and debate, it's always about new drugs and vaccines sort of gets a bit left out. And I don't really understand why that is the case, particularly as it relates to animals. In fact, uh, a real puzzlement of ours during our review is how little thought seemed to have been given uh, about the role of vaccines uh, for treating uh, infection risk in animals. Uh, and that in itself, if it was particularly encouraged through whatever uh, measures countries uh, could or would choose to do, would obviously have a massive impact on the unnecessary use of antibiotics, hence why it's both a supply booster and an unnecessary demand reducer, sorry, uh, a, a, a demand reducer of unnecessary antibiotics too. Uh, which brings me to uh, the three pure supply side ones. One is uh, human capital. We, need, we needed and still need more people that actually uh, are doing the proper scientific research on this stuff. Uh, not surprisingly, because of the uh, commercial aspects of it, ultimately, over the past 30 years, the number of people that actually are gurus on antimicrobial resistance, the science, has gone down. Uh, but I would say, <clears throat> this is based on nothing other than personal anecdotes and the amount of time my uh, invitations get extended and my inbox gets bombarded, it certainly seems to me in the past three years uh, we have turned a corner on that and it might relate to increased public awareness but there are definitely, <coughs> in my view, uh, more people uh, appearing as researchers in this space and as again some of you will have heard me say because one of the other things I have on another hat I wear is so-called Northern Powerhouse. Uh, there are more uh, AMR centres in the north of England these days than there are regions that have had devolved powers from this government, which uh, is a nice dilemma, but uh, there's ways of solving that which I could bore you with. Uh, linked to that uh, is the money going into uh, uh, early stage research. Uh, and I noticed, because it relates to the next topic uh, of new drugs I'm going to talk about as well. Uh, Kevin uh, Utterson, the head of BARDA, uh, is interviewed or quoted in the White Times newspaper today, if you've not seen it. Uh, and BARDA has been at the core of a significant uh, increase in early stage financing for new drugs. Um, and as again, some of you that have seen me recently talk about this, that together with new researchers are probably the two most promising areas uh, where progress has been, if anything, stronger than we might have expected. If I tally up the total amount of uh, money um, said to be given to early stage funding, if that were to carry on for five years at the same rate, it would be bigger than what we called for in terms of $2 billion dollars uh, in our final review, and that's very heartening. However, as Kevin has pointed out in his comments today, and I have uh, increasingly been doing uh, to uh, policymakers here in the UK, and one of the reasons why I was really trying to uh, encourage Matt Hancock to have the boldness that he did a couple of weeks ago, is that unless we see some more serious activity from pharmaceutical companies in this space, it will start to dry up, particularly from the private sector VC world that is looking for something, of course, to take them out of their VC investments. Uh, and it's very interesting to see that Kevin uh, touched on that in his comments today, because uh, it gives me more belief that that is right. And as I try to emphasize to people, the whole nature of how we came up with our interventions was to link them together. So yes, it's fantastic that we've got a lot more money supporting more researchers and early stage research, but unless there's something more going on uh, in terms of taking stuff beyond stage one in, uh, through phase two and phase three and bringing them to market, eventually the early stage support will, will vanish. That is why, coming to the ninth one, uh, what Matt Hancock announced, which I see as a pretty reasonably close cousin of our recommended market entry rewards, uh, is actually quite bold. Uh, and I hope any of you that are from uh, major pharmaceutical companies, 
you take up that uh, initiative uh, because it's the sort of thing that we believed you needed to be offered uh, to get excited on your own commercial terms. And as I've said to a couple of them directly on email, if you don't, uh, sticks might come instead of carrots. Uh, and I think in that regard, this is an important moment that has just happened with the UK here. Uh, and what I really like about what Kevin said this morning, what other countries are now going to follow what the UK has done? Uh, and Germany, who loves to talk about how committed they are to all of this, should be able to follow something similar, I would have thought, quite easily. Uh, and of course, uh, the big kahuna themselves, the United States, if it were possible under this peculiar uh, presidential leadership we have. Whether India uh, has the resources to do that as a government or not, uh, I don't know, but it should certainly uh, support the intention. And next time, another important thing, sorry, about the timing of this, coincidentally, which the Department of Health wouldn't have thought about, uh, this has been announced a good four months before the next G20 meeting, uh, which is going to be held in June uh, of this year, earlier than is typically the case, um, due to the election season of the host country. Um, this gives a chance for the G20 itself to embrace the sort of thing that the UK has just announced and then gets through the whole of the G20 system, which, as Kevin has said, if that were done and it were real, then we would essentially have unlocked uh, the whole supply chain. Uh, I must add that it requires vaccines and diagnostics to be part of it as well. And then the last thing, of course, inter international cooperation. I've essentially talked about that already. Uh, on one level, uh, another reason why the review was so gratifying, we were at the core of how this became an issue on the G20 agenda. Uh, typically, it's a place that doesn't think about that many health issues. Uh, but here, David Cameron uh, and George Osborne, um, with their own persistence of uh, of never-endingly talking about it to their counterpart prime ministers uh, and finance ministers when they met, because uh, I saw it in person, was, uh, was extremely useful. And I have to also say, in the context of the BRICS, so was South Africa. Uh, if it wouldn't have been for their uh, negotiating and persuasive powers within the BRICS country settings, that probably wouldn't have happened. Uh, but now we've had three consecutive years where AMR has been mentioned by the G20, uh, and the last one a bit less than before, which was slightly disturbing, but there was still a lot of fuzzy, nice words about a model for financing new drugs and vaccines and diagnostics. Here is the chance for them to follow it up, given what's just happened here in the UK. Um, so uh, why don't I stop there? Uh, I think I've talked for about 20 minutes, as I said, and it should give you uh, any time you want for questions. Otherwise, uh, you can get on with whatever's next and enjoy your afternoon or have lunch earlier. Thank you very much. Anybody have a question? David. <coughs> David's rescuing me. <coughs> Thanks, Jim, for a very moving presentation with some, some very good ideas. My question is about discussions that were held this morning about regulation. Hmm. And you didn't mention regulation that I heard. And regulation is considered important, but I, I like your access, not excess. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit about regulation and enforcement at the same time. Oh, gosh. I don't know what to say about it. Um, obviously, both are highly necessary, um, particularly um, in the context of international agreements. Uh, but as we find in other walks of life right now, um, countries that don't want to pay any attention to them easily flout them. Um, and so, uh, the rest of what I say will be somewhat contradictory. 
Um, I think it is really important that something follows through from the high-level UN agreement, um, but I wouldn't want that to be regarded as some kind of European Cup, stroke World Cup, Olympic champion winning moment, um, because it's easy to say a lot of these things, but as I say, through other walks of life, we see it's so easy uh, for countries to ignore or walk through them. Um, so I don't want to diminish the importance of all those things, and as you and I have talked about quite a bit, David, there are different ways of doing it. Um, but uh, here's the other two parts that contradict why that's so important. You know, we have the WHO, we have the FAO, we have the OIB, and we have the UN. Uh, from what little I understand of all four, you know, in principle, they have a lot of powers. Um, and they haven't been able to enforce a lot of these things that, in theory, they should have enforced. I'll never forget uh, joking with Sally Davis after I'd been first persuaded by David Cameron's advisors to lead this review when I got bombarded with stuff that WHO had published on it. I'm like, well, looks like they know all the solutions. Why, why do you need anybody? Uh, and so ultimately, uh, and here's the second part, it kind of depends how serious individual countries are. Um, and that's why it is good to see not only the UK actually doing more um, for itself uh, and trying to break the logjam in some of these areas, but being a greater force of example setting elsewhere, which of course, along, I should have said earlier, it often seems to us as a review team that the Scandinavian countries, generally speaking, are, are, sorry Sally, are possibly the best of class uh, globally, um, but we need more of those. And if countries are serious about it domestically, then it makes it easier for what gets agreed uh, globally to be actually followed through properly. Um, the one other thing to say, which is an interesting development, uh, I, I picked up on a, a, an idea that Peter Sands, I don't know if that name means anything uh, to any of you, is the ex-CEO uh, of Standard Chartered Bank from many years ago, coming from the, the dreadful world of finance like myself, but he's got very interested in global health. And he wrote an interesting piece about trying to get, uh, for broader health issues, uh, the International Monetary Fund to start monitoring countries' uh, health preparedness as part of their so-called Article 4 uh, surveillance practices. Next Tuesday, the 12th uh, of February, the IMF is hosting an internal one-day event on whether indeed they should start to get involved in all this stuff more, and I'm actually being invited to go along and speak. And I, I think something like that would be a helpful development because the Article 4, for those of you not immersed in the arcane, weird, irritating world of economic stuff, uh, is, is, is essentially based around a report that they write on all member countries and can often influence the credit, ra credit rating agencies, which in turn ends up influencing the countries. Uh, and if uh, health preparedness uh, is treated as a serious part of that, I, I think that itself would, make, would force uh, all IMF member countries to start to treat some of these things more seriously. Gentlemen, next to you. <clears throat> and there's a couple at the back. Uh, there is a history here of uh, governments and uh, uh, politicians trying to control antibiotics. So in 1997, there was a BMJ supplement on prospects of control mm -hmm. where the... Um, idea of controlling antibiotics in the community had no legal basis and was difficult to predict. Um, Dame Sally Davis actually identified the top centile, 5% centile of prescribers of antibiotics and actually wrote a cease and desist letter to the, these GPs saying if they continued to do that, then they would be up against uh, some legal sanction and maybe even uh, lose their, uh, their license to practice. Mm -hmm. The FDA had a, a period where they wanted to control antibiotics, antibiotic use, 
and they were told by the legal gentleman that this was not uh, able to uh, occur in, uh, in practice, so they actually dropped that. Well, I, I didn't, I'm surprised to hear that, I didn't know that, but uh, you know, let me just reiterate, uh, the single most aggressive uh, of our 27 recommendations in the review was that by 2020, which is now, uh, what, uh, ten and a half months away, uh, no Western uh, developed country should be prescribing antibiotics unless it's gone through a state-of-the-art diagnostic test. And uh, when I discussed that at length with senior people in DH here and uh, ministers, which I've done again recently, uh, I never hear that. They say that they're not quite ready for it yet. Uh, but I think, I, think, I think it's getting closer. Uh, as it relates to uh, animals, because you mentioned the FAO, um, gives me the chance to talk about uh, another somewhat positive development going on as it relates particularly to Western countries. That uh, there's something going on in the generational change uh, which is forcing uh, major food distributors to get involved in this stuff. Um, I'm not sure if any of them are present here, but uh, here in the UK, the, the, the major uh, supermarket chains have, have now got their own antimicrobial resistance group going, and I've, I've participated in one of their meetings. And to my pleasant surprise, I think they're more serious about it than I uh, would have suspected if I wouldn't have gone. Uh, and that's what we ultimately really need. We need to play on this thing that, because you know, I'm sufficient of an economist to believe that uh, uh, individual choices matter. If, if consumers, for whatever reason, uh, particularly from a younger generation, uh, don't want to be eating stuff that's got so many antibiotics in, then that's a really good development. And whether the lawyers don't like it or not, I suspect that will end up having quite a big influence. There's a couple of people at the back. By the way, I see signs of, even stronger signs of that going on in the US. We often call it the Shake Shack factor. Um, interestingly, you raised the uh, point that animal health vaccines might be a very productive area to reduce antibiotic use. And yet, there's been no real evidence of any activity within uh, the pharma industry, particularly as they've shrunk nearly all their um, you know, livestock pharma enterprises and very little funding getting down to the blue skies research, at the sort of fundamental research needed in infectious disease. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you had any comments to make on how this might be achieved. Well, I think it relates to central government policy ultimately, doesn't it? Uh, just as an aside, um, I joked about the number of AMR centres around the UK. Uh, by coincidence, the one where I did my PhD, Surrey University, actually has some uh, AMR specialists working purely on uh, the agricultural sector, including vaccines. And I'm, I'm sure there must be others uh, in the UK and elsewhere, but they, they, they certainly are. Um, but I think it, it boils down to governments uh, and maybe actually also the supermarkets uh, getting involved to, to use simple um, cha changing uh, incentives or, 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 in this case, relative treatment tax-wise of vaccines versus antibiotics to essentially encourage uh, the role of, of vaccines relative to antibiotics. But this is one of the things we specifically recommended because it seems so obvious to us. That's somebody behind that gentleman. Last question, I gather. Hi. Um, yeah. You mentioned about trying to encourage the uh, pharmaceutical industry to sort of develop drugs in this sort of uh, AMR field. Yeah. I just wanted to know that I'm sure you've heard recently quite a lot about Ocambi and uh, cystic fibrosis and the drug pricing in the UK. It's that uh, the governments are suggesting invoking certain patents and sorry, revoking certain patents and producing ge cheaper generics. Uh, and then how to really reward public funding which was invested in developing the drug in the first place is, do you foresee that maybe in this area we need to think about the sort of funding models as to how to commercialize something from the lab into the actual field? So, um, I hear from the way you asked that question, you, you haven't seen the specific uh, announcement that Matt Hancock made in this space. 
or maybe I just misunderstand you. Because uh, the whole the whole reason why it's so interesting in the little that's been said publicly so far, but and he, he did say the details to be worked out in the next six months. Important important message for the pharmaceutical companies in the fact that as it is for others, but in the next six months. That means, in my view, that the pharmaceutical companies have got six months uh, before the stick gets bigger than the carrots. Uh, but the, the reason why I say that is, um, unless I've been misled, the, the changing the whole nature of how the health service here in the UK is going to purchase antibiotics and pharmaceutical companies uh, as a deliberate incentive that for the ones that are really needed, they will, they will give a guaranteed uh, sum. So it's very, very close to our market entry reward type idea. Um, so it, it, it is proposing a pretty different approach as far as I understand it. I think we're done. Thank you very much. Good luck for the rest of the day.